All right. So today I want to talk about estrogen versus bone health drugs, specifically bisphosphonates. And I came across this study that I was um, uh, researching for a new talk that I'm doing on hormones and bone health. And I uncovered just a host of studies, but this one in particular, I want to bring to the attention of this audience because it, it points out so eloquently a couple of important things. So number one is just how powerful hormone replacement therapy is for bones compared to bone drugs. So number one. Number two, that dose probably matters. And I have some other studies on that I'll present later, but this one goes into that as well. But then also the type of replacement. And this is an interesting study from the 1990s. So it gets into some historical prescribing patterns that I think may really play a role in bone health. So stick around. I'm going to go through this study. I'm going to talk about just how powerful it is. And if you're thinking about hormone replacement therapy or you're on drugs and you're wondering how effective one is versus the other. You're definitely going to want to see this. This should be relatively quick. So let's go. Okay. So this is the study in question. Now, a couple of things. Um, when I do a, a literature review like this, I always want to look at some big things out of the gate, which is, you know, when, when was it done? Is this outdated information? Is this relevant information? In the late 1990s is a really interesting time frame because this is when hormone replacement was being used a lot for a number of things we don't use it for anymore. You could argue that's good or bad, um, but this was this study was created during a time when hormone replacement was very popular. This was before the Women's Health Initiative. This was before we started fearing estrogen as a big cause of breast cancer. So this study was done without that mystique, that, that guise of negativity over the top of it. So then the next thing I want to look at is to say, oh, where'd this come from? Well, the New England Journal of Medicine is obviously a well-known, high-impact journal. Lots of people read it. It is highly scrutinized when it comes to publication. So this is a well done article just by definition, if it made it through the editorial process in the peer review process to get into this journal. The next thing here then is what are we talking about? Well, the title of this is prevention of bone loss with alandronate, that's Fosamax in postmenopausal women under 60 years of age. So that tells us who, and it tells us kind of what we're looking at, but we need to look at the methods to understand a little bit more detail about what they actually did here. All right, so this table goes into kind of what they did here. Um, and there's some really interesting things here. So let me just give you the basics, which is they essentially did uh, 2.5 milligrams of Fosamax versus five milligrams of Fosamax daily. Um, and then I don't know why they would do this, but for whatever reason, they added in another group of hormone replacement therapy. And I don't know from a drug perspective, this is a, uh, this is a, um, drug company sponsored study. So I don't really know what they were thinking here, but I'm glad they did it. And so uh, you have the two different doses of Fosamax and then you have hormones. And they went into some really interesting detail with the hormones, but a lot of the charts, unfortunately, only use, they just say estrogen and progestin, um, and they, they lump all of the hormone centers together. But this study was done in four different centers, two in the US and two in Europe. So there's some different prescribing patterns here, and they do end up breaking that out in, in some of the areas. But here we just see that there's estrogen and progestin together. And I'll talk about the specific drugs that they used in a minute. Okay, so when it comes to outcomes, what they were doing here is looking at DEXA specifically, and then they also talk about um, adverse reactions to the drugs. And so um, this is a typical drug trial where they have a, a very clear outcome, and this is good. And the reason why the drug trials can be so powerful is because this trial included over 1,100 individuals. So when we look at a lot of hormone replacement uh, trials, they're relatively small. And I have some others that I'll share in some different videos, but you're talking about groups the size of like 20 or 40. And so that's why we kind of have to rely on some of like the big cohort studies, retrospective reviews that have thousands of people to try to get a sense of patterns because these small studies aren't going to be big enough to pick up um, um, some of the uh, rare side effects. But a study of over 1,100 people, well, it's better. And it's not as big as it could be, but it's pretty good. And so what you can see here in these graphs, and I'll describe this for those listening to this on a podcast, is that you have a graph looking at the the uh, change in time on, on the bottom and on the y-axis, the bone mineral density change. And so as you would expect, the placebo group lost, and I think they lost um, somewhere in the US cohort, it was somewhere around 2% over two years, which is what you would expect in this age group, right? And then the two drug curves um, are two and a half would be the lowest, five is higher. And we know that that's the, the preferred dose over two and a half, two and a half would be a very low dose of Fosamax. Um, and then you see the hormone 
levels above that. And so I'm going to get to the actual specific numbers here, but you can just see very clearly that the hormones outperform the drug over the course of the two years when it comes to bone mineral density. But what you also see here is that there's two different graphs. One is the US cohort and the other is the European cohort, meaning that they, they broke these down because the interventions were different. Okay, so let's take a moment to talk about these interventions because uh, in the late 90s, the same drugs that were used in the Women's Health Initiative were commonly being prescribed. That's why they used them. So the two drugs in this trial are similar in the US as we saw in the Women's Health Initiative. So this was uh, conjugated equine estrogen, CEE, also known as Premarin, uh, the, the brand name, and then MPA or medroxyprogesterone acetate. So MPA is the progestin, the synthetic progesterone that was used um, in the Women's Health Initiative. It goes by the brand name Provera. Now these two have lost market share, but they are still used today, uh, although not a lot of people use Premarin anymore. And there's some reasons why, which we can get into later. But in the US, they were using Premarin, Provera, or Prempro together if they're marketed that way. And um, this is done in a static manner, meaning that you get the same dose every day. In Europe, they were using a drug called Trisequence. Now, I hadn't heard of this drug before because it is, uh, I don't think any, I don't think it's used anymore, um, but it's an oral estradiol that is a two milligram dose, which is a fair dose, two milligram dose days one through 22, and then a one milligram dose days 23 through 28. So now you can see they're starting to try to mimic natural rhythms of hormones. And then they use norethindrone uh, days 18, 22, which is a relatively short window actually uh, to use progesterone. But either way, um, they're using um, oral estradiol, which is bioidentical, uh, but it's oral. And then norethindrone, which is a, a synthetic progestin that has a little bit of an anabolic uh, property to it. So this is starting to mimic uh, the natural rhythm could potentially provoke some either breakthrough bleeding or actual uh, menstrual bleeding when you withdraw um, the uh, progesterone after the 22 uh, day there. So uh, this is more of a, a natural rhythm style. A, you could call it a physiologic uh, style of dosing that was much more common in the early 2000s and late 90s. Okay, so when we go on to look at other areas, and I, what I showed you before was the lumbar spine bone density, and I'm going to direct your attention now to the right here uh, where we have the, the hip. And the hip graph is really interesting too because the hip doesn't change as much with the drugs. Uh, in fact, some of the drugs, most of the drugs don't reach statistical significance with the hip because the hip has more what's called cortical bone rather than cancellous bone. The cortical bone is the hard bone on the outside. Cancellous bone is the kind of what's called spongy bone in the middle. It's not necessarily that spongy, um, but that's the, they're two very, very different bones and they will uh, change and turn over at different rates and different things will affect the trabecular bone versus the cortical bone. Uh, so it's important to look at both. So the spine is mostly trabecular bone uh, with a little bit of cortex. The hip is a lot of cortical bone with, with still some trabecular bone. And then they also show here a forearm, which you can see in the bottom part of the screen. Um, the, uh, uh, the forearm is almost all cortical bone. There's very little spongy bone. And um, so the drugs are going to all uh, impact this differently. And so what you can see here, though, is that the even in the hip, the HRT outperforms. And in the forearm, both of the drug trials, uh, the two and a half and the five milligram actually lost bone, similar to what happened with placebo. Um, but the hormones actually improved bone, although just barely, almost, you could say probably just kept it stable. Uh, but the hormones at least kept it stable, if not improved the bone. And this is again, all cortical bone in the, the forearm. And now when it comes to adverse events, they did a good job of reporting the overall numbers of which there were a lot, but it's interesting in their description. They didn't really go into detail on this. And they pretty much just said that there was no statistical difference between any of the groups. Uh, but you do see some pretty big numbers of, you know, types of adverse events. But remember, in drug trials, they're asking about everything. So including like nausea, including, you know, headache, including like all these things that are going to happen for lots of reasons. So I'm not surprised to see these numbers. It's nice to see that there's not a significant difference between the two. Of course, we want to know really a more long term, though, what's the, the impact of being on a bisphosphonate versus being on HRT. OK, so what I'd like to do now is just put some absolute numbers on this because the graphs look nice. But for those of you that are listening to this on podcast, they don't really mean anything. So let's just talk about the numbers. So um, for the spine, we saw that the placebo group lost 1.8 percent, so negative 1.8 percent. Um, of bone mineral density over the course of two years, which again is pretty typical. The highest dose Fosamax gained 3.5%. 
the U.S. dosing of the hormones, the static dose, gained 4%. And the Europe dosing gained 5.1%. And so when you look at the, what I like to look at it as the, the difference and the difference, meaning the difference from placebo, not from baseline. So then the highest dose of, um, uh, Fosamax was 5.3% difference, U S dosing hormones, 5.8% Europe dosing hormones, the rhythmic, uh, dosing at 6.9%. So you can see clear superiority in the European group likely because of the different, probably both dose, higher dose for half of the cycle. And then also um, uh, using sort of an anabolic version of a synthetic progestin, which I still wouldn't recommend, but it's interesting how that could potentially add a little bit to it. In the hip, you saw in the control group, negative 1.6, again, kind of what you would expect. The five milligram group saw a 1.3% increase. So again, you're always going to see less in the hip than the spine, or at least for most drugs, the difference between the two, 2.9%. In the US dosing for hormones, 1.8%. So again, that's compared to the Fosamax of 1.3%. And then the Europe dosing, 3.2%. So big jump with cortical bone here in the hip. Um, the difference between uh, the US dosing and difference, the, the difference from placebo is 3.4% versus 4.8%. So again, significant jump at this point, you're talking almost a 50% jump from the static to the dynamic dosing. And then finally in, in the forearm, because this is essentially all cortical bone, you saw the placebo group lose two and a half percent. The Fosamax five milligram group lost 1.4%. And the US dosing lost 0.3% and the European group gained 0.5%. And that's why it looks like at zero on average. And so um, again, you just continue to see that the different type of dosing, higher dose, rhythmic dosing is going to have a bigger impact on bone mineral density. So why do we see results like this? Why is it that there is such a difference in this different type of dosing? Well, I think it comes down to three things. So number one is going to be dose or strength. So in the post WHI or women's health initiative era, which is what we're still in, the fear around estradiol caused dosing to really go as low as possible. The recommendations were literally use as little as possible for as short a time as possible. And I understand that fear, but I wish that we could have seen through the flaws in the research at the time. We are still suffering from that because people are afraid to use bigger doses of estradiol, even though we're pretty confident that estradiol doesn't cause cancer, but there is a role of estradiol in cancer. And so there's still this Fear. These paradigms of cyclic dosing, uh, physiologic restoration are going to use higher levels of estradiol. So there's a lot of fear around potentially doing that and provoking a negative consequence. But I think a lot of that fear is misplaced. The power, though, is that we see in the literature there is a clear threshold of how much estradiol you need to actually impact the receptors on bone. I think it's gonna vary from person to person. We do see some people get benefit from low dose HRT, but we see lots of people on low dose HRT that are still losing bone. So I think most people haven't met whatever that threshold is. It's probably somewhere around 60 to 80 picogram per ml, which most low dose regimens are not gonna get you to. So then these potential higher dose regimens are gonna hit that threshold and go above it. And I think that amount is required for some people to have the impact on bone that we wanna have uh, for them for their bone health. So I think the second most important thing here is gonna be route. So how are you getting these things? And I guess I'm gonna, I'm gonna mix route with form. And so if you look at the older studies, a lot of these are done with synthetic progestogens or synthetic progestins. They're not micronized progesterone. And so when you're dealing with progestins, you have to understand that there's a lot of them. It's hard to look at the literature because there are so many different versions, but you can get a sense from the literature that progestins are going to have higher risks just across the board. Certain progestins are strongly associated with increased risks of breast cancer, other estrogen-driven cancers, because some of them do react with estrogen receptors. Some of them are going to have a higher risk of stroke, of heart attack. So I like to stay away from those altogether. If we're going to consume progesterone, we need to consume it preferably as an oral capsule. If that's not tolerated, then the potential for topicals is there, but we have to be careful for those with a uterus. So that's a topic for another day, but form matters, especially with progestins. Um, with estrogen, we're looking with estradiol. We really wanna work with estradiol. So biased, estriol, Again, topic for another day. It doesn't have an impact on bone. Estriol does not protect bone. 
we need estradiol. So how do we get it? You can get it orally, uh, as was demonstrated in this study. Our preference is topical because it's going to reduce the, potentially the risk of blood clot, although that's questionable, uh, but we can reduce that risk of con in that conversation altogether just by using a topical estradiol. So again, uh, route and form matter. And then the third is timing. So I've shown here this study, and then there are numerous studies in the bone health world that compare both a static dosing regimen versus a cyclic or physiologic regimen. And the physiologic regimen is always more powerful for bone. So there may be a role for restoring estrogen and progesterone cycling that would potentially provoke either breakthrough bleeding or an actual menstrual cycle, depending on how you do it. But that push pull that you naturally get in a premenopausal state will have a bigger impact than static dosing in a postmenopausal state. So then final conclusion here is that Fosamax as a bone health drug is not as powerful as HRT, period, even if it's synthetic. So these were forms that I wouldn't recommend, but they still outperformed Fosamax. Plus, hormone therapy is a long-term plan. Fosamax is a short-term plan. So demonstrating very clearly here with a study funded by the pharmaceutical industry that hormone therapy outperforms Fosamax. All right, so that's it for today. Um, if you are still struggling to kind of put things together for yourself and you're looking for help with hormones specifically, consider joining our Hormone Masterclass. Now, you may have joined our Bone Health Masterclass. We're going to run a specific class just on HRT because the, the amount of time that it takes to go through all the details, we can't stick that in our Bone Health Masterclass. So we now have a, a Hormone Masterclass that I, I do as well as some of our other providers will run. Um, when we go specifically through HRT, all the pluses and minuses, the risk, benefit, all the different styles to help you to create your own pathway when it comes to your hormone replacement therapy. And I think customization is so, so important here. So consider us for that free masterclass opportunity. If you're looking for a community of people to help you with your bone health, consider our HealthSpan Nation. Links for both of those are in the description below. The HealthSpan Nation is our community of individuals helping each other to uplift and improve their bone health. They're also listening to us on a weekly Zoom, topic-driven Q&A. There's a content vault, discount codes for products and services that we vetted. So definitely check that out if you're looking for that community. HSN is awesome. So fun to lead that and to be a part of that. That's it for today. So remember that osteoporosis is not the end, but deciding to reverse it is the beginning. I'll see you in the next video.